Greetings to the flock and friends of Forest Street Baptist Church. I do pray that you've been doing well. Uh, Betty and I have been doing very well. We've been following some of you on Facebook. Many of you have kept your sense of humor uh, throughout all of this. And uh, we've seen some funny things posted. I think the funniest post I've seen so far shows Chris Farley entering the studio of the David Letterman show. I mean, he's so excited to be there. He comes running down the aisle just crazy, whooping and hollering and high-fiving everybody. And uh, the caption is that this is the way many pastors are going to look. On that Sunday, we all finally get back together and worship together. As you see that, now, Matt might be able to do that, but I don't have that much energy. Uh, actually, looks more like Brian Williams coming down the aisle than anybody else. But anyway, do appreciate Tim and Rick and Tamara for coming in to help us with this. They did so last Sunday and today, and we couldn't do this without them. We appreciate that. But we look forward to getting back to having services together as soon as we can. Uh, we may have started off with multiple services of small groups, and as soon as we get the green light to do that, we will do so. And I do look forward to seeing uh, our church family back together again in God's house, worshiping together. But we're going to continue with our study in Ephesians. This is a series within a series as we look at the armor of God that is pictured here in the last section of the epistle to the Ephesians. So I hope you're ready to put on the armor of God. We're going to be looking at each piece of the armor and uh, what it means to us. Uh, here's an external picture of something that is really internal and, and essentially spiritual. So bear in mind that as we proceed to the interpretation of these different parts of the armor of God, kind of keep in mind, here's Paul He's a prisoner writing these epistles, and uh, here's Roman soldiers around him wearing this different armor, and he knows each part of the armor, and then speaks of how God can provide such armor for us to wear, that we might have victory over Satan and the flesh and the world. He begins with the belt. Let me read the entire passage. I want you to see all the different parts of the armor and we're going to notice them one by one in each message. But look at verse 14, Ephesians chapter 6. It says, Stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, having on the breastplate of righteousness, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith we should be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. So let's begin with the girdle or the belt. And the next message, Brother Matt's going to speak on the breastplate of righteousness. And in the next few studies, we're going to look at uh, the combat boots, our feet shod, the shield of faith, the helmet of salvation, the sword of the spirit. Let's begin with the analogy of the belt. Think about the purpose of the belt. The soldier's girdle or belt is it's not an adornment. It was a necessary part of their uniform, of their armor. Now keep in mind, in Paul's day, uh, they would wear flowing robes and garments such as this. The purpose of the belt was to gather up and bind together the loose garments that they wore so that they could work more freely or fight without any hindrances. I mean, have you ever tried to fight in a dress? Uh, you ladies probably have. My wife has. It's 
harder for her to catch me when she's in a dress. That really hinders her. But uh, you might understand that. Wearing these kind of garments, they would need something to cinch up the loose garment so they'd be more free to work and fight. So it's an essential piece of their armor. It was essential to everything. It's kind of a foundation garment. You start with it, and then you add the other things to it. Then you note the putting on of the belt. The very putting on of the belt, in and of itself, braces one up and prepares him for action. He's ready. He's alert. He's free to, to go to work or go to battle. So it kind of reminds me of the difference between a pessimist and an optimist. The pessimist will wear both a belt and suspenders. The optimist will wear neither one and has no hips. That's an optimist. Now you're probably thinking of somebody right now that uh, kind of fits that description. But we as Christian soldiers, we must put on the belt of truth. We must be prepared to do battle. Another way to put this is to gird up the loins of your mind and be sober. That's from 1 Peter 1.13. Gird up the loins of your mind. Be sober. In other words, get serious about the cause of Christ. Make up your mind to be ready and involved in the great cause of the Lord Jesus Christ. Then note the purview of the belt. Another translation would be stand having girded your loins about with truth. See, the belt represents the truth. The truth in and of itself, which we are to put on. In other words, we're to have a settled conviction with regard to the truth of God's word. You know, Jesus said to his disciples in John 8, 31 and 32, he said, if you continue in my word, then are ye my disciples indeed. And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. It will set you free from Satan's bondage, from Satan's deception. So in order to be free to fight the wiles of the devil, you've got to be grounded in the truth of God's word. God tells us, 1 Peter 5, 9, resist the devil, stand fast in the faith. You stand fast in the faith in order to resist the devil. The truth and the faith are the same thing. Those ignorant of truth will be an easy victim of Satan. And we've already noted in Ephesians 4, verses 14 and 15, we had this warning from Paul when he says that we be no more children tossed to and fro, carried about with every wind of doctrine, by the slight of men and cunning craftiness, whereby they lie and wait to deceive. But notice, but speaking the truth in love. Now, we can't speak the truth if we don't know it. So we need to get into our Bibles and study this every day. By the way, is there a book in your home that gets read a lot? I read across this. I've... I've had this for a number of years, but it kind of talks about what's the favorite book in some homes. It says, on the table, side by side, the Holy Bible and the TV guide. One is well worn and cherished with pride. No, not the Bible, it's the TV guide. As the pages are turned, what shall we see? It doesn't matter, just turn on the TV. Then as the confusion started, for all can agree. What they want to watch on the old TV. So they refer to the book in which they all confide. No, not the Bible, the TV guide. The Word of God is seldom read, maybe a verse or two before bed, exhausted and sleepy, tired as can be, not from reading the Bible, but from watching TV. Then back to the Bible side by side, the Holy Bible and the TV guide. No time for prayer, no time for the Word. The plan of salvation is seldom heard. Forgiveness of sin, so full and free, we find in the Bible, but not on TV. That's kind of convicting, isn't it? Which book is read more in your home? 
Second thing I want you to see is the authority of the Bible. The authority of the Bible. First, I want you to think about the attacks that we see today upon Bible authority. The popular attitude of our day is that it doesn't really matter what you believe as long as you live a good life and love one another. You see, unity is preferred over doctrinal soundness. I remember a few years back we had a couple come to our church. They were visiting, looking for a church home. He told me that they had stopped, he had stopped during the week at a Southern Baptist church here in town, and he met the pastor and the deacon. He was asking them about their beliefs and their doctrine. He said this pastor and deacon said to him that they're not hung up on doctrine there. And he said to this man, the church you want is Florence Street Baptist Church. And he came and joined our church. Now, I'm glad we've got that reputation. We are hung up on doctrine here. I think every church ought to be. But what is being taught in many places is that truth cannot really be defined. They say Christianity is divided. Because some have insisted on particular doctrine. They say such a policy only divides us. They say we must all agree that truth is so great and glorious that we really cannot define it. They say truth is something that's caught, not taught. Now in the light of that, to express any criticism of false doctrine, that's terribly wrong to these folks. They get offended at that. If you say a certain teaching is wrong, then you're labeled as being a contentious spirit. So you got these liberals today. They denounce Paul as being arrogant, having a wrong spirit for exposing false doctrine, trying to defend the truth. But here's the question. How am I to put on the belt of truth if it cannot be defined? If truth cannot be defined... Where do we find his belt? We're in a perilous situation, folks, if the Bible is not accepted as our sole rule of faith and practice. And yet many, many who stand in the pulpits today, deny the divine inspiration and inerrancy of the Bible. Listen, if we can't rely on the Bible, what are the alternatives? Upon what can we really base our beliefs? Let's think about some alternatives that people offer to Bible authority. Can we, can we rely on human reasoning? Is that a safe guide for us to follow? That seems to be the answer for many. They just rely on human reasoning based upon their knowledge and understanding. Now here's men full of vain pride thinking that they just figured all this out in their own minds. But folks, our minds are finite and faulty. It's defective because of depravity. Well, what is human reasoning when faced by the reason and knowledge of the devil? I mean, can we match wits with Satan? Also, if reason is to be our guide, then whose reasoning do we follow? See, we don't all agree, do we? Now, after we reason it all out, are we to follow the reasoning of one or two people when it comes to spiritual matters? If every man's reason is to be taken as the guide, then really we have no standard at all. Every man will do as he sees fit. That's what happened during the time of the Judges. You read the book of Judges, Judges 17, 6. says, in those days, there was no king in Israel. But every man did that which was right in his own eyes. You see that? They decided what was right, what was wrong. Proverbs 14, 12. says, there's a way which seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. It seemeth right to the man. God said in Isaiah 55 verse 8, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. 
We have so much for human reasoning. We really can't count on that. Can we count on human conscience? Some say, let your conscience be your guide. Yet, one man's conscience may allow one thing, while another's conscience will not allow that very same thing. A man's conscience is dependent on what he has been exposed to, what he's been taught, what he has chosen to believe. I'll give you an example. A Hindu mother can throw her baby to the crocodiles as a sacrifice to her gods and do it with a clear conscience, thinking that it is right to do so. Saul of Tarsus, who wrote this, this epistle, was he not following his conscience when he was persecuting God's people? Is God satisfied as long as you're sincere? I mean, is that what the Bible teaches? Jesus denounced the sincere Pharisees, didn't he? I mean, they were very sincere about their beliefs. But they were sincerely wrong. Paul later said of them in Romans 10, verses 2 and 3, They have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. For they, being ignorant of God's righteousness, have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. See, they were zealous, sincere, but they were ignorant of God's word. So we can't rely on human conscience, human reasoning. How about human feelings? There are many today who are guided by their feelings. It's what you feel, what you experience that matters to them. And there's a lot of people today, they're looking for some emotional experience as proof that they're right with God, that God has spoken to them in some way. But folks, feelings can be so easily counterfeited. I mean, they cannot be trusted. They can deceive you. You ever been afraid of something that wasn't there? You thought it was. You felt like there was something there, but there was nothing there. That's why the Bible says in 1 John 4, 1, Believe not every spirit, but try the spirits, whether they are of God. Many have been deceived. By lying spirits. Some people join a church that way. They join a church based on how they feel about it. Now, they don't really investigate what that church believes, what that church teaches. Some will join a church because the preacher stirs their emotions. Or maybe because the music makes them feel good. Or maybe because uh, they've got a good youth program and, and can entertain the kids. But they really don't look at what that church believes, what that church stands for. Some people say, well, it doesn't matter what the Bible says. I know what I felt. I know what I experienced. But let me remind you, Jesus rebuked some for that. He said to some, except you see signs and wonders, you will not believe. In other words, he's saying, don't depend on that. Don't depend on signs and wonders to guide you. How about church denomination? Some rely on that, don't they? Now, there are churches that claim to have the final authority. The Roman Catholic Church is one. They say that the Bible is good, but it's not enough. They have other revelations. They have their church councils and their church decrees, which to the Catholics is just as good as the Bible. So the Bible is not their final guide that they follow. But listen, the church is only safe, a safe guide, when that church adheres to the Word of God. Paul said the church is to be the pillar and ground of the truth. Now, we're not to add to the scriptures. We're not to take away any of the scriptures. Yet many follow the dictates of a denomination knowing that that denomination contradicts the scriptures with some of their teachings. Matter of fact, Jesus denounced those who follow traditions of religious leaders. If you look over to Matthew chapter 15, let me read verses 3 through 9. This is what Jesus himself said about this. Matthew 15, 3, But he answered and said unto them, 
Why do ye also transgress the commandment of God by your tradition? For God commanded, saying, Honor thy father and mother, and he that curseth father or mother, let him die the death. But ye say, Whosoever shall say to his father or his mother, It is a gift, by whatsoever thou mightest be profited by me, and honor not his father or his mother, he shall be free. They're saying that you don't have to, you don't have to provide for them. Just say that I've already dedicated this to the temple or to uh, whatever. And you don't have to give it to your father or mother. In other words, he said, Thus have you made the commandment of God of none effect by your tradition. He says, You hypocrites, well did Isaiah prophesy of you, saying, This people draws nigh unto me with their mouth, honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. In vain they do worship me. Look at this. Teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. And a lot, a lot of that's being done today. The doctrines of men. The Bible even talked about the doctrines of demons are being taught in many churches. So the Bible's never wrong. Just honor your parents. But here, here's another thing. Some people are relying on family, parents, grandparents, for what they believe. They accept certain beliefs simply because that is what their family believes. That's the kind of church they belong to. They really don't bother to investigate to see whether or not it conforms to Scripture. Now, folks, listen. We're accountable to God, not to family. We stand before God on Judgment Day. Honor your parents, but parents, when it comes to Scripture matters, are not the final rule of faith and practice. Go to the scriptures. Look at the word of God. Many follow family tradition. And they don't want to offend family by leaving a church that is not scripturally correct. But who do you answer to in the end? Folks, the Bible is never wrong. Search the scriptures. The Bible says, 2 Timothy 3.16, because... There is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. By way of a personal note concerning this. Now a lot of people are what they are because that's what they were raised. Many are Baptists because they were raised Baptists. I was raised in a Baptist church, in a Baptist home. My father was a Baptist preacher. But you know, as a young man... I sometimes wondered if maybe dad, maybe he was wrong. And some other church was the true church. And that kind of bothered me for a while. So as a young man, I really began to study the scriptures to see if what we taught, what we believed was truly in keeping with the Bible. And as I studied it out, I'm not a Baptist today by convenience, by tradition. I'm a Baptist by conviction. I believe we can trace our church heritage back to Christ and the apostles. Now, folks, listen. Do you know what you believe? And do you know why you believe it? That's important. As we move on, the third thing I want you to see is the assertion of Bible authority. The Bible is the final authority of our faith and practice. It claims to be the inspired word of God. Now, the issue is clear. Do I accept Scripture as the revelation from God, or do I depend upon reasoning or conscience or my feelings or others' opinions? Is the Bible the inspired Word of God? Well, Jesus regarded it as such. He often pointed to Scriptures as the final authority. He often said, what saith the Scriptures? He always wanted to come back to what the scriptures had to say. He told some, you do err not knowing the scriptures. He said in John 10, 35, the scripture cannot be broken. He said in John 5, 39, search the scriptures. For in them you think you have eternal life, and they are they which testify of me. So Jesus stood on the holy scriptures as final authority. Now, folks, if the Bible is not the inspired word of God, then we're left without a standard to follow. 
And by the way, we're just wasting our time studying this book if it's not the inspired Word of God. We might as well be studying the writings of Shakespeare or Socrates. That brings me to the next point. That is the acceptance of Bible authority. This church, 4th Street Baptist Church, stands upon the Word of God as being inspired and inerrant. We embrace it wholeheartedly. We embrace it as the final authority of our faith and practice. We don't question it. We don't attempt to explain any of it away. Folks, here we take our stand. We are committed to the Word of God. Now, before we can do anything else, we must gird our loins about with truth. How can we fight the devil? Where can we find this truth that we must gird on as we put on the armor of God? Where can we find it if we cannot find it in the Bible? Folks, here's the foundation. Either we accept this as our authority or we don't have any. I want to ask you, do you accept this book to be the absolute truth revealed to us by God? I believe the more you study it, the more convinced you become. I've, I've been preaching this book for close to 40 years. And the more I study it, the more convinced I become. This is the Word of God. There's no doubt in my mind that this is the inerrant Word of God. And the final thought is this. That is the application of Bible authority. We cannot be content with just being hearers of the word only. James 1.22 says that. He said, be ye doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. We can't just stop with hearing it and reading it. We've got to put this to practice. We've got to obey it and practice it daily in our lives. So if you want to be girt about with truth, you have to come acknowledging your weakness, your insufficiency, your inability, your impotence, and realize the Spirit of God must work upon you, enlighten you, and give you the understanding of God's Word. Here's where we begin. Put on the Bible belt. It's God's complete revelation of truth. You need to hear it. You need to honor it. You teachers need to handle it wisely. We need to heed it. We need to hold on to it. Putting on the armor of God begins with this. So I ask you, have you put on the belt of truth? 2 Timothy 2.15 says, Study. Study God's word to show thyself approved unto God. A workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Our youth program is called AWANA. And that stands for approved workmen are not ashamed. It's based on that verse. We want our children to be taught, to be indoctrinated in the word of God. Now listen, if you're not saved, you're on Satan's side. You're in his camp. But today, you can leave his camp. You can come over to the Lord's side. You can be saved today by repenting of your sins, by asking the Lord Jesus Christ to come into your life to be your Lord and Savior. You can do that right where you are. Just bow our heads in prayer. I do want us to remember the prayer requests. Remember our president and our leaders, our doctors and nurses. There are so many we need to be praying for uh, in, these, in these times. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we just pray that your will be done in our lives, even as it's done in heaven. We know that we're created in Christ Jesus when we're saved, that we may do good works, which you have ordained that we should walk in them. So teach us to do your will, to follow the Holy Spirit who leads us in paths of righteousness. Deliver us from the wicked one, from his attacks. I pray you to build a hedge of protection around each family in our church. Lord, protect them. Draw us closer to you day by day that we may be able to resist the devil, that he may flee from us. 
Help us put on this armor that we're studying. Help the men of our church to submit to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. And that we'll just learn to submit one to another, minister one to another. I pray that you would just bless our people, bless those who are dealing with this virus. We pray for families that have been affected by it, whether health-wise or economically. Some have lost their jobs because of it. Lord, we just pray for each one. Pray for our president, for that team he's put together to deal with this, and for the doctors, nurses. Lord, we just pray for all of them. Many heroes have stood up and been counted during these days. And Lord, just bless us. We thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ and for his work on the cross, his great sacrifice, that we might be saved. And we pray for peace, love, and joy in each home. Remind us, Lord, daily of the victory we have in the Lord Jesus Christ and how to live that victory each and every day. For it's in his blessed name we do pray. Amen.